we believe in the things we can touch and see. We can put our feet on the floor. We can feel water on our hands. Like, we believe in those things. But God is even more real than the things we can see and touch. It does sound crazy to say that you can know God personally, especially when we think of our human relationships, that we know our parents, that we know our spouse or the person we're dating, that we know our children or know our best friend. It's hard to think that we would know God in that way when we can't see God, we can't hug God, we can't do the things we're used to doing in our human relationship. But there's another side of us as human beings. We are in our bodies and we do have a mind, but we also have souls and we have a spirit inside. And that is a part of us that sometimes in our everyday life, we don't tap into, we don't connect to that. I was an only child for 10 years until my sister was born. So when you're an only kid, you don't have other siblings. You use your imagination and you play, you know. I had my stuffed animals and my Barbie dolls. I had all those things. And I think sometimes in our life, when we don't have certain things, in a way, it does give us a chance to broaden our minds in a way. And so I feel like there have been times of life that have been lonely that give me that opportunity to also get to know God and that I'm not alone. And so one thing that I would say to a friend who asked me recently, like, how, how, how do you pray? And when you pray, how do you know that God is listening? You know, how do you know that God's hearing you? And all I can say is, just try. I know it might feel weird. You're in your apartment or in your house or whatever. It might feel weird. You're like, what are you saying? You're telling me to open up my mouth out loud and talk to someone that I can't see, you know? And I'm saying, yeah, I want you to try. I think a great place to start with our faith and with trusting is we just gotta try a little thing. And sometimes that little thing is maybe to have that moment where you're gonna say, all right, you know, in whatever way I talk to God, I'm gonna try that today. Or whatever way I think I could write something to God, I'm gonna try that. Or I'm gonna open up this Bible. I've heard a lot about it, but I'm gonna open it up and I'm gonna try just reading a little bit for myself. I think that's a great place to start. Just try. Ask God to show you who He is. Amen. Wasn't that? <laughs> Sometimes it's those simple things. Um, watching that video just reminded me of uh, that prayer that I had prayed when I was like 16 years old, uh, just try and just open up to see if God is there. So this morning, uh, welcome to Regeneration Church. Uh, we are on week seven. This is our last week in Explore God. And um, I'm just gonna uh, pray and just ask God to open up our hearts to be um, able to listen. Sometimes we come in with so many things that are going on in our hearts and minds. I, I know that that's how I am. Um, Often, I'm on the other side of this. So we just got back from a pastor's conference, and I was on the other side. I was the ones, uh, you know, that are there listening. And sometimes it takes a while for our soul to catch up. Our bodies are here, but our soul needs to catch up. And if you're watching online, it takes a little bit longer. You got to shut everything else off to be present. So let's ask God to meet with us. Father, today, uh, this is a, a topic that is so dear to those of us that know you personally, but God, it's such a curious topic for those that are wondering, can I really know you? So I pray in the same way that you answered me, though the same way that you've answered so many millions of people, billions of people, God, that have just said, Lord, if you're there, then show yourself. Help me to find you. Today, we pray that you would lead us and guide us unto truth that you would show us that you are there on the other side of this prayer, that you hear us. 
So we come to you with our, our lives. You know, you know what's going on, our anxious thoughts, our questions, our doubts, and even our hopes. So we bring these things to you now, and we pray that you would meet with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, can I know God personally? Um, maybe you're thinking, well, that's, that's a personal question, right? Uh, when Deanna and I were in uh, West Virginia, we went whitewater rafting. We were visiting her family, and uh, we, we get on this bus, and we're going to this trip, and uh, the guide gets up in front of everyone on the bus, and uh, he said, hey, welcome. You know, there's, we want you guys to have a great time. We're going to be riding some rapids, and uh, we, we want you to know because we want to have a good time, we have a rule there's two things that we don't talk about. What are they? Politics and religion. Two things that we don't talk about, politics and religion. And everyone says, yeah, you know, they just start cheering. And, and I get it because it could be very tense uh, at times. But I think instead of saying there's two things we don't talk about, because those are important things in our culture and society, I think it's more important that we teach people and we learn to have conversations with grace and truth and respect, even with people that disagree with us. Because when we don't have the ability to do that, then what we have is we have a false unity. Like you could be sitting across the table from someone else, angry at them or not like them or have different views, but you're not able to have those conversations. And in our current world, this is before social media when they said that, people have these conversations instead of face-to-face -face over a cup of coffee, it's online over Twitter or over Facebook or something else. And so all of those voices and all of those opinions, they come out. And yet that question, can we know God? Can I know God personally? I'm going to speak to you personally today. Uh, because your faith is a personal subject, and I'm a pastor, and this is what pastors do. You wouldn't be surprised for me to talk to you about this, right? So thank you, because this offers me a freedom to be able to share some things that maybe you wouldn't just walk down the street, or maybe with a friend you might not open up this uh, subject with. It's a personal thing, but it's also a thing that um, throughout history, people have asked these questions. And so when I think about knowing God personally... Um, I wanted to share all, oh, that noise up there, that's our junior hires, by the way. Our, our middle schoolers, they're running around. Middle school is meeting upstairs, so if you heard that, no, no worries, that's our middle schoolers. Um, we just got back um, from uh, the Calvary Chapel International Pastors Conference. It was at Calvary Chapel Golden Springs, that was last week. And it was a blessing because my two pastors in my life, um, Don McClure and Raul Reese, have been my pastors. They were two of the the teachers, two of the pastors that were there. We got to meet with a bunch of other people. I mean, Sandy Adams and Damian Kyle, some great, great messages. And it reminds us that our church is larger than just our church, right? It's the church. And then if you broaden that a little bit wider when it comes to groups, we have um, the Bay Area, uh, 100, over 150 churches just in the Bay Area going through Explore God Together. This was a picture that was taken in Estes Park about three, four years ago, and you'll see people that maybe you recognize in there, like uh, Steve Clifford and Renee and Kevin Harney, Gary Gadini. Uh, there's John and Nancy Ortberg and Mark McGovern. These, these people have become friends that have different um, networks. You know, we're in the Santa Cruz Pastors Network, and they may be in other parts of the Bay Area. Different denominations, there's differences in some of the secondary things, but, but really the heart and the goal is to share the gospel in the Bay Area. That's, that's one of the reasons why we're doing this together. We want to ask these questions that are difficult questions that people are asking. Um, we, we want to help answer some of those questions. And also we want to help those who are being asked. How do you answer these questions? Maybe you believe in Jesus, but you're wondering, how do I answer the questions for others but also I added a third thing. It's for those who are asking others and listening. Sometimes, again, in the awkward conversations of, of personal matters, sometimes we don't know how do, we, how do we share and maybe just ask a question to someone else and listen to them. Because when you ask someone else a question and you care enough to listen to what they have to say, 
maybe they believe and they know that you want a relationship where you're willing to try to understand where they're coming from. And maybe they're gonna ask you some questions as well and you could, you could share those things. So ask others those questions. The same questions that we as Christians have to answer, other people face those same questions. What is the meaning of life? Where do I find purpose? What happens after this life? Why am I here? What about the problem of suffering? What about the problem of evil in our world? Those are all questions that everybody is asking. And when we listen, it opens up the opportunity to build relationship. Um, Last week, we looked at how can an ancient book help me? How can the Bible, how can this ancient book help me when I feel ashamed or when I feel uh, guilty? How can this book really help me to Uh, when I feel purposelessness or fight injustice or help the marginalized, find belonging in a community, um, get to know God personally. I love one of the things that we looked at. We looked at what Vadi Bakum said. Uh, Vadi Bakum said, I choose to believe the Bible because it is a reliable collection of historical documents written down by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses many of whom who later died as martyrs because they would not recant, even though before the resurrection of Jesus, many of them denied him. They report supernatural events that took place in fulfillment of specific prophecies and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. Oh, and it worked for me also. So it is so important. Not just I believe the Bible because it worked for me, not just I believe the Bible because this is how I was raised, but if you take the Bible and you compare it to any other work of literature, you realize that it could, it could be a reliable source to find truth. And by reliable, it just means that if I put the same test to the Bible as other works of literature, I, I could believe that what is written here was authentically written and was, was verified. It's not a modern construct. The, the thing about prophecy really amazes me because prophecy is something that you can't plan I can't plan today to fabricate a document that a a thousand years from now will have certain things come true. And when you just look at the prophecy of the Bible, it it causes you to think, what is the origin of this? By the way, uh, there was a slide last week and someone pointed it out online uh, that uh, I said that the first manuscript was in 63 AD and I meant that the first writing. So the Gospel of Mark and the Epistle of Galatians and First Thessalonians were around that time. So thank you for whoever was out there and uh, saw that. You were Berean. That means that you actually studied this and go, hey, what he said, that was wrong. And, and if I say something that, that's wrong, then don't just believe me because I say it, all right? So you do your own research and you look into those things. So today, how can I know God personally? Again, we're going to finish up Explore God it doesn't mean that we'll stop exploring God. Uh, la- next week, do you remember these books? Okay, we handed these out, and uh, these are the Gospel of John. We are gonna go back through this. And so uh, you have a Bible, the Gospel of John's in there, but these are really cool because there's places where you could write in, you have the text there. You know how sometimes if you own a baseball card for a long time, it goes up in value? These books just went up in value. For those of you that still have them, bring them next week because it just, it just went up in value. Uh, we, we're going to look at this question, how can I know God personally? And for that, I would like you to turn with me to the first book of the Bible. It's Genesis chapter 16, if you have a Bible. And we are going to look at this question through the lens of someone that I think will be a surprise to you um, probably a surprise to me as well. If you think about people in Scripture, what person in Scripture would you look at to say, how can I know God personally? Like, what, what people would you consider? Just throw out some names. Just yell it out. David, David Abraham, Abraham, Naomi, like different. All right, this is, those are all good because they all knew God personally. But we are going to look at someone that was the first person in all of scripture that sees what the Bible calls the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord is a phrase used in the Old Testament to represent the second person of the Trinity or Christ, 
a pre-incarnate um, appearance of Jesus. And that person is a woman who is not um, Jewish. She's not Hebrew. In fact, uh, she is outside of the covenant of God's um, chosen people in the Old Testament, and she was uh, a servant, like a slave. And her name is Hagar. Hagar becomes the mother of a boy named Ishmael. And Isaac and Ishmael, they fight against each other somewhat. They're descendants. Uh, you have the beginning of the Arabs and you have the beginning of the Jews. With Abraham, um, two different sons and two different lines. And I just want to pick up uh, the story of Hagar in Genesis chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. Genesis 16, verse 1. It says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, so this is, we know her as Sarah later on. God changes her name to Sarah. And Abraham, his name was Abram. So Sarai and Abram's wife had borne him no children. Now in Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abram to leave his place, to leave his family and go to a place that God would show him. And he said, from you, I'm going to multiply your descendants like the stars of the sky, like the sand of the sea. You're not gonna be able to number or count them. And through you, I'm gonna bless the world. That was the beginning of the, the Hebrew people, the, the Jews. Um, but also, in that time, since God had given Abraham that promise in uh, Genesis chapter 12, time has gone by, and Abram and Sarai are still not able to have children. And there's a lot of pressure Sometimes, and I, I get it for women that have maybe um, a desire to have children and are not able to have children. Um, in Hebrew culture, especially at this time, there was even more pressure. Uh, it was a, a woman that was not able to have children um, felt like she couldn't uh, continue the line of this covenant or this family line, and and was looked down upon at times by others. So this was an emotional thing, and I. I know that it's still emotional, so I, I just want to be aware of that. If you desire to have children, if you're a, a, a couple and you want to have kids and you're not able to, um, Ab Abram and Sarai, uh, when, you, when you read a, of their, their account, you could understand the emotion that's there. So they, they want to take things into their own hands. Previous to, to the, the way that we could have um, what uh, they would call a surrogate child through... Um, you know, artificial insemination or something like that, they would have a servant. And a servant would, would be like a, sur a surrogate mother. So she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. In verse two, so Sarai said to Abram, see now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. So like God gave us this promise, we're gonna have kids, we're not able to have kids. And now this frustration at God God, how come you're not doing this? How come we're not able to do what we, we wanted to do to have uh, a family? You even told us that we would be able to do that. And um, see now the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. And she goes, now please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Husbands, this is not a good idea, right? This is uh, something where I hear, you know, um, Callie, who you, Callie and Daniel, Daniel was one of the elders here, and, and Callie Orozco, uh, they moved to Texas like a third of California did in uh, the last few years. Uh, Callie taught on this one time, and as she was teaching on this, she was teaching on Sarai um, as a woman, from a, a woman's perspective, and she could not get through it without just weeping, and, and it totally changed the way that I ever saw this. You know, so, so often we could take a Bible story that we know of and we can just immediately put the meaning onto it. But I remember we were at a camping trip with uh, the college and career, the young adults ministry, and um, as she was sharing this, um, it, it really hit me. And I started to see this is, this is what Sarai is going through. But we're not gonna focus on Sarai and we're not gonna focus primarily on Abram today. We are going to focus on this woman named Hagar because Hagar is mentioned almost like a sidelight to the whole thing that is going on. 
she's mentioned as an incidental person to the story of Abram and Sarai. And too often we could read these uh, portions of scripture and, and go immediately to these people that we know of and not, not see the other people. And, and what did this feel like for Hagar? I'm just a, a maid, I'm just a servant, and now I, I'm supposed to, because you decide this, I'm gonna have a, a child, and it's not even gonna be able to be my child, and then, and then you're gonna take my child? If Sarai was having a difficult time, what kind of a time do you think that Hagar is having? If someone else is talking about you as though you're not even there. You ever, isn't that frustrating when people talk about you like you're not there? Like right in front of you? Parents, we are notorious about doing this. With We're talking, you know, mom and dad are talking about their son or daughter and the son daughter's right here in the room as though they're not there so, so think about what this is like for uh, a woman like Hagar. It goes on. Um, so they decide to, to do this. And uh, again, we're not going to go super in depth, but verses three and four go into what actually happens. I'll just read it to you. After Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, um, he took Hagar, uh, the Egyptian, her servant um, that, that Sarai gave to Abram, her husband, as a wife. By the way, there is something when we study scripture called description versus prescription. When the Bible describes things like this, this drives me crazy. People go, see? Polygamy, it's all over the Bible. The Bible describes murder, and it, does, it describes murder. It doesn't prescribe murder. It doesn't say go ahead and commit murder. So when we see Things that people do in the Bible, and you read it and go, oh, this book, like people do. You got to look at the whole context, and you got to understand the whole thing, that God, the story of God's redemption. So Abram and Sarai, they're not trusting God at this point in time. They're not following God at this point in time. So don't think, okay, well, Abram did it. <laughs> Father Abraham had many sons and many sons. Yeah, I'm one of them. Like, I could do the same. No, don't. Don't take the Bible's description as prescription. So in verse five, Sarai said to Abram, because what happens is um, Hagar gets pregnant. And then in verse four, Hagar starts to look at, at Sarai like, oh, the problem is you. See, I was able to get pregnant. And I, you, you understand that, right? You understand why she's kind of doing that. What is the phrase? Hurt people hurt people. So you take, like, you guys just, just treated me as property. I'm impregnated by Abram, and now all of a sudden, like, the child's going, but then, oh, the problem's you. See, I, I can have a baby, and started looking at her like that, despising Sarai, and Sarai feels even worse about her situation. So she said to Abram, my wrong be upon you. In other words, this is this is your fault. This is your fault. Um, I gave my maid into your embrace. And, and Abram, even though we're not focusing on them, should have been sensitive to his wife and how she was feeling. Men, sometimes our wives drop hints and we never pick them up, right? Like sometimes we could drop hints to people and not notice. So it, she said, I gave my maid into your embrace and when she saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. So Abram, trying to fix it, said to Sarai, indeed, your maid is in your hand. Do to her as you please. What do you want me to do? Honey, what do you want me to do? I'll fix this. I will make it right. What do you want me to do? And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her. So Sarai starts to deal harshly with um, Hagar, and Hagar leaves. And, and I, don't you understand why she would take off? Like you're being mistreated, you're being in a place like this. And so even though it would have been a dangerous thing for Hagar to leave, no protection, no provision. Imagine her being out in the desert somewhere, out in the wilderness, under no covering. She doesn't have, she just, she, she runs away. And I want you to notice that when we feel that way, um, 
sometimes we isolate and we draw away from people. And I saw this happen so much in 2020, and I've seen it happen over the years. Trauma, a hurt, someone, like bad things happen. A church goes sideways, a person goes sideways, uh, a friend goes sideways. All of a sudden, someone that you trusted in, you can't trust them anymore. Um, someone dies, you get sick, you lose a job. Like trauma happens many times relationally, and you don't know who to go to, and what happens is we run. And we run and we go into technology or we isolate or we, we focus on something outside of ourselves that we can focus on. But I want you to know that even if you have run and even if you're running, God sees you when you run. And it's not a dangerous thing and it shouldn't be a scary thing. I'm, I'm super thankful that God sees me. Um, if you've ever run away as a child for that little bit of time, because um, there are serious runaways, but then there are the fake runaway threats, which I've done, I'm just gonna run away, you know, like in second grade or third grade or whatever. And, and uh, maybe like, like me, your siblings or your parents said, okay, you know, here's a sandwich. You know, you're gonna need this and here's, here's some water you're gonna need. And you're like, wait, wait, you're supposed to talk me out of it. Like, um, and, and, but if you've ever really been lost, aren't you glad that someone came to found you, find you? Um, uh, I, I just, <laughs> I shared with you last week, m one of my sons went on a solo backpacking trip last week and, uh, in a place where there was no reception and no roads to get there. And uh, his pickup, his rendezvous spot was on Highway 1. If you go south on Highway 1, it's closed in Lucia. If you come from the south, you go north on Highway 1, it's closed at Gorda. And this place in between, you can't drive to. And his plan was pick me up at 7.30 at night in the middle of this place that's closed <laughs> to his brother. And when I found out, I was like, oh, I might have to go find him. So I went to... I took a bunch of stuff and I went to go find him. And um, thankfully he made it to a ranger station and was able to call and go to the south place and drove four hours to pick him up in the south part and picked him up and, and uh, I just felt like God gave me this opportunity to let him know, hey, because uh, he realized how far it was and then he realized, oh, you, you drove far. And I go, yeah, I did. He said, wow, that's really far, yeah. And he goes, oh, I'm sorry. And I said, hey, I just want you to know um, if you or your, your siblings are ever in trouble or you need help, doesn't matter how far you are or what I have to do, I'll be there. It was just a great opportunity to let them know that. Um, I'm thankful that I have a father in heaven that even when I run away, not that my son was running away, he was just backpacking. Um, even when I run away, God knows where I am. So I think about uh, Hagar. I want you to read this scripture with me in verse seven. The angel of the Lord. It's the first time that this phrase, the angel, means the messenger of God. The messenger of God. It's the first time the messenger of God, I, I believe this to be a pre-incarnate, um, the second person of the Trinity, that Jesus Christ himself appears. The first time the angel of the Lord is mentioned in scripture is the angel of the Lord found her when she was running when she was isolated, when she felt alone, when she felt by herself, when she felt trauma, when she felt no one cares, when she felt no one understands, when she felt like there's no hope, God found her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur, and he said, and I want you to notice this. It's the first time in the whole account that anybody calls her by name. She's described in third person, Hagar the slave or Hagar the maidservant, but whenever Sarai mentions her, she doesn't say, go ahead and sleep with Hagar. She says, take my maidservant. And Abram says the same thing. Oh, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll take your maidservant. It's like she, she, doesn't, she doesn't have a name. 
a name is so important to people. In fact, uh, you single people, little clue, remember if there's someone that you are, are thinking, hey, that might be someone that, that maybe I'm gonna marry someday or I'd like to get to know better, remember their name. Because Deanna talks about the first time that we walked through the halls of Azusa Pacific University and I had uh, a class, I had an English class with Deanna and I got to know her because the professor would call her by name and I thought she's really cute, I would like to get to know her. And I was walking down the hall and she's walking by me and I said, hi Deanna. And she stopped, she's like, hi, uh, what's your name? And I said, I'm Matt, I'm, I'm in your English class. She goes back to her, I find out later, she goes back to her roommates and said, there's this cute guy in, I mean, she, she's blind, but this cute guy in my English class and he, he knows my name. God knows your name. And God knows your name because he has been watching you. Not in a creepy way, not, not in a stalking way. He knows you because he created you for relationship. I, I think Hagar must have been so shocked because this is not my God. This is the God of those people who mistreated me. And there are so many times that the thing that keeps people away from following Jesus is people that are Christian or call themselves Christian. Some of them may really be Christian because Christians aren't perfect. Some may not be Christian, but, but call themselves Christians or some religious person. And that is the reason why I don't follow God. Maybe that's you today, and maybe your struggle is with the way the church or people that are Christians have treated you, and I think that Hagar must have been absolutely shocked when the God of these people who mistreated me finds me and says, Hagar, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from? So I know your situation. I know that you're Sarai's maid, but I know you, and I know who you are. Where have you come from and where are you going? This morning, I think these are questions that God is asking. I think if we, whether it's here today or when you're quiet, answer these questions, where have you come from and where are you going? And think about your life. Where have you come from? What brought you to this moment in time to hear this message, whether you are online listening to this or you are here in person listening to this, where have you come from? And then the next question is, where are you going? Where are you going? What, what does the future hold? You know, at, at the end of the message, I'm gonna give an opportunity to respond. And I just want you to know that it's not a pressure opportunity to respond. Um, I, Deanna and I, we went to this, uh, the, first, the first timeshare thing we ever went to. We, I don't remember how we found out about it or we got invited or we got this thing in the mail or whatever and says, oh wow, free TV just for showing up. You know, free this, free that. And then we get there and then man, it was the most high pressure thing ever. It was in a hotel like a Hilton and they, you go into this cubicle and there's these balloons that are there and like, oh wow, this is a really happy place, you know? And then all of a sudden the guy, you know, pitches us about everything that's going on and then, and then you too could be the owner of this timeshare that you paid this money for. And then you hear these balloons getting popped and everyone cheering and like, what's going on? The balloons being popped or, oh, that just means someone said yes to this timeshare. Okay, we are not going to do this for you today. Like, I'm just letting you know ahead of time, there, if the Holy Spirit, if God himself is, is like, there's something in your heart, and, and this is not just for people you don't know Christ yet, it's for people that know Christ or have walked away from Christ. There's opportunities to respond in faith. So I'm just letting you know this question, where have you come from and where are you going, that you could be honest with God. And sometimes we're not honest with God with our prayers. Sometimes we tell God all of the things that we want him to know and we keep the things we don't want him to know a secret. I only wanna to talk to him about these things, but not these things. These things are just for me. And I want you to see she is honest and says, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. You could just let God know your situation. Someone has hurt me. I have been struggling to trust you because these things have happened to me. This is my health situation. 
This is where I don't understand. If you're real, why would you allow this? Just open up, just, just kind of like in the video that the, the, the woman said, yeah, just try, just talk to him. In verse 13, I want you to see, um, well, let me, let me back it up because we're not gonna go super in depth. Like I said, that this would be a whole teaching in and of itself. God tells Hagar that she's going to have a son. That son is going to be Ishmael. And, um, and uh, he says, God has listened to your affliction. Uh, he shall be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, everyone's hand against him. He shall dwell over and against his kinsmen. I just want you to know that um, when it comes to Ishmael and when it comes to um, Isaac, Abraham's son, the father of, uh, you know, the, the Arabs, the father of the, the Jews that come through those lines, not, and just really important that we understand this, it'll be real quick, but not all Arab people are Muslim and not all Jewish people have a faith in the God of Abraham. Okay, those are ethnicities, not faiths. Okay, there's a difference between the two. Uh, a Jewish person can be an atheist, and an Arab person can be an atheist. But I'm so thankful that there are Arab people and Jewish people that have come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So God wants to reach everyone. And, and, and there's a lot of stuff that's going on. Uh, you know, politically, and you see things on the news and all of these things that are happening, and just know that God so loved the world. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't have to have an, uh, an understanding or a view of what um, is happening in the war um, with Israel and, and Hamas, okay? B because we could talk about that. There's a Q&A time afterwards, but, but I do wanna say this. If we ever take an ethnicity and say we don't like those people, it's not the heart of God. It is not the heart of God. So in verse 13, she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her. So I love this. God, the angel of the Lord, appears to Hagar and calls her by name. And you know what she does back to him? She gives him a name. She calls him El Roy which means you are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? This morning, maybe you've had these clues as we've been going through Explore God that there is a God and he sees you. But did you know that also you, like Hagar, can be at a place where you could say, I've also seen him who sees me. You could know God personally. Um, couples often will have these nicknames that they don't want other people to hear because they would be embarrassed. Uh, schnookums or like cuddle bunches or whatever the, the nickname is. Uh, it's a term of endearment. Um, and then someone else hears it and then like you're done. You're done if someone else hears the name sometimes. But, but in this case, realize that when when God has a name, he's not God generic. Do you remember that? We looked at God has a name. He's not God generic. He's gonna introduce himself in these pages of scripture. And we are going to look at another story now of another person in scripture named Zacchaeus. So turn with me to the New Testament book of Luke, Luke chapter 19. And we are going to look at this passage here. Luke chapter 19. By the way, I took a picture of Zacchaeus yesterday. Uh, I was in San Juan Batista at the St. Francis uh, Retreat Center, and Zacchaeus was in a tree. And um, <laughs> Daniel Berriman was uh, climbing a tree. I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Let me take a picture of this, because tomorrow I'm teaching on Zacchaeus. And this is like a perfect picture to go with it. So Reenactment uh, of Zacchaeus in the tree. Luke chapter 19. <laughs> Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. So Jesus, um, this is awesome. Uh, as, I'm, as, I'm teach, as I'm reading this, there's new things that are the Holy Spirit's just bringing them. This is incredible. 
Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Um, Hagar was a woman outside the covenant of God, despised by Sarai. Um, and yet Zacchaeus is uh, a, a, a chief tax collector. Jewish people would be conscripted as tax collectors by the Romans. The Romans would say, okay, we don't even speak their language, we don't know these people, but can you go ahead and collect the taxes? And, and sometimes I've heard this um, compared like tax collectors are like the IRS. Uh, I get it, I understand what you're saying, but it's, it's not like the IRS. Can you imagine if IRS could knock at your door and you answer the door and they say, oh, uh, this is how much you owe, give it to me. And the, the collection agent can decide whatever they want to charge. Because as long as the Romans get their part, they don't care what you charge. You can charge whatever you want. And a tax collector would not only rip you off, but a tax collector was a traitor because that was a fellow Jew and would come to you and say, hey, I'm gonna collect taxes. And this was not only a tax collector, Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, which means he probably took money from the other tax collectors. And it says, and he was rich. But in verse three, even when, and here's an important thing, someone is doing something that they know is wrong. Even when someone knows that what I'm doing, yeah, it, it doesn't look good on me. I, I realize I, it's beneath me, but I'm just doing it anyway. Even those people wanna find out who Jesus is. So don't, don't say no for someone else as though they don't wanna know who God is because look at what they're doing because Zacchaeus was doing something. He probably hated himself. Any of you, and not, not, don't raise your hand. This is not one of those things, a show of hands. Have any of you ever hated yourself and so you started punishing yourself by doing something bad that hurt other people but you also knew that it hurt you and you said, I don't even care. I don't even care. And, and you just think there's no way that God would ever want anything. Jesus would not want anything to do with me because I'm just hurting other people and I'm hurting myself and I, I don't even care at this point. It says in verse three, he sought to see who Jesus was but could not because of the crowd for he was of short stature. Zacchaeus Wanted to see who Jesus was, but I want you to notice sometimes the crowd keeps us from seeing who Jesus is. And sometimes the thing that keeps us from seeing the real Jesus is the crowd around Jesus. The people that we see how they act, we see what they're like, and I don't fit in with them. In fact, those are the people that have rejected me. And because those are the people that rejected me, I, there's no way I could see him. But he has this curiosity, and I want to encourage you to continue to pursue to find out who Jesus is even if there's people that are following and crowding around Jesus that are blocking your way of seeing Jesus. And so because he was short of stature in verse four, he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for he was going to pass that way. So here's Zacchaeus back in the tree wanting to see who Jesus is. Runs ahead of the crowd. And by the way, when it comes to altitude like that, when, when I would play hide and go seek as a kid, I would love to hide. I always tried to hide above the sight line of people because people look under tables and they look under chairs, but if you could get on top of something, you could hide all day long because people don't look up. Zacchaeus isn't doing this to say, hey, Jesus, I think he's doing it to find out who Jesus is, but he's thinking, this is a safe place for me to get up on this perch to be able to see him where he can't see me and other people can't see me and I could have this view of him. And he comes up, he, he, you know, the sycamore tree to see him. He was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up. I, I just think that this is an amazing thing. Jesus walking crowd of people pressing upon him. 
uh, just imagine like if you've ever seen an entourage of people trying to get autographs of someone or, or like bodyguards or people pressing them away. And I just imagine these people are coming and the disciples are saying, hey, back off, back off. And Peter, you know, has his sword and like, he's like, get away, get away. And Jesus came to the place and, and he looked up and he saw him. What did he say to him? What did he call him? He called him by his name. Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. I, I love this because if the pre incarnate Jesus is the angel of the Lord who calls Hagar by name, Jesus here in this tree calls Zacchaeus, or sees Zacchaeus in the tree and calls Zacchaeus by name and says, Today I must stay at your house. In Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens up that door, I'll come in and eat with him. I'll have fellowship with him and him with me. And I love this because he says, you climbed up that tree, but what you were doing is you were, you were opening the door. Today, you're here, you're listening, maybe you're listening online, and by you being here, Making effort, it, it's an effort to climb a tree. No one climbs a tree by accident. Like you could get lost by accident, go down an alley or walk into the wrong room or do something, but no one's like, hey, how did I get up in this tree? Like I was just walking and now I'll, here I am, I'm in this tree. There's an effort. If you're here, you made an effort. You got up this morning, you got dressed, you drove here, or you said yes to someone that invited you, or you turned on your phone or your computer or you're watching later on, and what you're doing is you're climbing up a tree. You're showing effort to listen. And I just want you to know that you're on the way to opening up that door. But verse six, so he made haste, Zacchaeus made haste, and he came down, and notice what he did. He received him. He received him joyfully. Have you ever received Christ into your life? He received him. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying he has gone to be a guest with a man who's a sinner. Everyone else is complaining. But, but Jesus, Jesus says this. Zacchaeus stood, said to the Lord. So Zacchaeus speaks first. He says, look, Lord. Notice he gives Jesus a name. Um, it's a title, but he calls him Lord. Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. In other words, Jesus, all these things that I've done, I, I, I want to turn. I, I want to turn towards you. I want to stop doing these things, and I want to receive you. And Jesus said to him, today, salvation, by the word, way, that word salvation, uh, that's it's a sozo, it's this, um, it's this life. Today, salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Think about this. To the Jews, a tax collector, you are, you're dead to me. Maybe you've had someone say something that brutal. You are dead to me. The Jews would say this about tax collectors. You are dead to me. You're outside of the covenant of Abraham. You don't belong here. You're not a part of the family anymore. You don't belong in this church. You don't belong in this place. And Jesus said, he also is a son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And I'm so glad that whenever we get lost, Jesus comes to find us. I think one of the saddest things is if you play hide and go seek with your parents and your parents get distracted and they forget to look for you. <laughs> and like, you're just hiding. You're wondering, when are they gonna come? I'm hiding really well because they're not coming. And then you come find out and then like, you know, your dad's staring at his phone, your mom's staring at her phone or whatever. You're like, you didn't even come to find me. I was hiding. I was like hanging out. The son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So my, my question, when it comes to a, a personal relationship with God, God knows your name, um, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you enter in to that personal relationship? Like Hagar, like, um, like Zacchaeus. There's a problem, and I think Zacchaeus kind of pointed to it, 
This is, and we'll close with these last scriptures in Titus chapter three. In Titus three, it, Paul is writing, reminding Titus of these things, and, and Titus is to remind the people in the church in Crete of these things. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Verse three is a terrible place to be. First of all, foolishness, irresponsibility, unwise decisions. Often people that do unwise things, they think, well, I have to go do wise things for God to accept me. But no, listen to this. We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, rebellious, uh, led astray, deceived. Maybe, maybe you've been led, led astray. Maybe your belief in Jesus, your belief in God was this thing of, um, um, it's a religion where I have to earn it. Or maybe God is after me because he, he's angry at me. We were once led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures. You could ask any person that is an addict, and it doesn't matter if it's an addict of alcohol or pot or an addict of um, meth or pornography or food or whatever it is, that those things that people enter into addiction for, at first thought, man, I'm totally free. I could do whatever I want. It's freedom until that freedom becomes addiction and there's not this ability and, and the, the slavery to sin and selfishness. You might notice about yourself, I'm a very selfish person and I can't change myself. I'm a very self-centered, full of pride person. I can't change that about myself. I hate people. I, I don't like people, I'm judgmental. But that's just who I am. I want you to notice it says that they were passing our days in envy and malice, hated by others and hating one another. If you hate one another, it's no question that people would hate you. But then it says in verse four, God had a solution. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, Jesus came to show us the goodness and loving kindness of God. He came to show us this is who I am. And then in verses five through seven, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness. He doesn't save you because you earn it. I don't think that this is a moment for quid pro quo. Do you know what quid pro quo is? It's like, if you do for me, I'll do for you. We don't, that's not our relationship with God. God, I'll do these good things and you have to do, it's not because of works done by us in righteousness. I remember when I was a, a teacher for a drug and alcohol recovery school where students were incarcerated and, and the, the guys that were in gangs always talked about doing work. Even when they were incarcerated, I gotta do the work. Because if you're doing the work, you earn your what? Stripes. You earn your stripes because you're doing the work, so that you belong to this gang. You, you have a place where people know you, and you have a position, and you have an identity. But God does not save us because of works done by us in righteousness. It's not the righteousness gang. <laughs> like, God, uh, look at all these good things I've done. I gotta I got get in. Just jump me into your gang of righteousness. Um, it's not about doing work. You can't earn it. And I'm so thankful that we can't earn it because if we had to earn it, we have to, if we have to earn it to get it, we have to earn it to keep it. And what kind of a rest is that? What kind of a life is that? If we have to earn it to get it and now we have to earn it to keep it. And then you have a bad week or you have a bad month or you have a bad decade and you're like, man, that was a bad decade and I'm so far in debt to God, there's no way I can get back. You didn't earn it in the first place, but it's by the washing of regeneration. It's by the washing of regeneration. And this is why our church is called Regeneration Church. It's because it's not about what we do to be approved by God. It's because of what God has done and he changes us from the inside out. It's not that, hey, I gotta do the work. I gotta be good enough for God to accept me. You know you're not good enough. You know that <laughs> and so does God. And he loves you anyway. God loves you, Hagar. God loves you, Zacchaeus. He knows you by name, and he invites you. 
It's through the renewal of the Holy Spirit. You're thinking, well, I can't be that person. In fact, I don't feel it. By faith, when you receive Christ, the Holy Spirit changes your nature. He changes you from the inside out. He changes your want to's. Because sometimes, like before I became a Christian, there were a lot of things that were good that I knew, but I, I didn't want them. I don't want to forgive people. There, there was a guy at my school that I could not stand, and I thought, man, there's no way that I could ever care about that guy. And it was crazy when I became a Christian. God changed my heart about that guy, and now I started, started having a burden to share Christ with that guy. And it wasn't because I desired to. It was he, God, the Holy Spirit, changed my want to. The Holy Spirit will change your want to's. So don't think, well, look at what Christians want and like people that don't follow, like I want to do these things. He changes our want to, but you know what you do want? You want life. You want meaning. You want purpose. You want forgiveness. You want belonging. You want redemption. You want to be used by God to help other people that are marginalized. You want to reach out to other people so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. There's the offer for the hope of eternal life. Now, what is eternal life? What is eternal life? If you answered, it's going to heaven when I die, that's a part of it, but that's not the definition. The only place that I could find in scripture where eternal life is defined is in John 17. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You know what eternal life is? It's to know God. Because when you know God, and you have that relationship with God, when you die, it's not that you start eternal life, it's life continues in another place, in another dimension. You see, eternal life is knowing God personally. It, it, it's not this ethereal kind of thing that's out there, nebulous force, like in Star Wars, the force. Uh, it's not karma that I, I, I have to earn it, and there's some force called karma out there that makes sure I don't get away with stuff. Um, it, it's not I have to go back and live my life reincarnated as another person or maybe as a grasshopper because I wasn't good enough. And then if I'm a good grasshopper, then I earn my way into a bird and then, from, and then like eventually, no, eternal life is knowing God. It's knowing Jesus Christ. So here's your opportunity in response. And the, we're, we're going to worship. We're going, going to respond in worship. If we have the worship team come up, by the way, the first response is this, and I'm gonna pray for you in a moment here. You're gonna have an opportunity between you and the Lord to respond. And I'm gonna tell you what these responses are ahead of time. One way that we can respond to the message is as a follower of Christ, I wanna respond by committing to share Christ with others. I, I, I might be scared. I might not have all of the right words. I might not have, um, I'm afraid of the relationship. I'm afraid of being ostracized or being made fun of. But by my actions and by my words, I'm gonna commit to sharing Christ and I'm gonna ask God to give me boldness and love for people. Love for people overcomes your fear, by the way. It's not that you start to share Christ when you don't feel afraid anymore. Your love for people overcomes your fear. And when God fills you with that kind of love, then you're saying, it doesn't matter what happens to me because I love this person and I want them to have eternal life by knowing Christ. That's the first thing that we could respond to. Secondly, we could respond like this. Maybe like Hagar, you have run from God. You still believe in God, still believe that God is there, but you have run away and you've isolated from community, you've isolated from other Christians, you've isolated from God, you're running from God. Maybe like Zacchaeus, you feel like, man, my behavior has been so bad, I've been doing so many things that I can't come back to him and I am going to encourage you today to climb a tree, to climb a tree, to say, Jesus, here I am, I'm climbing a tree, I made some effort to get here. 
and I'm responding. I'm going to raise my hand. And, and I'm not going to ask you to climb a tree literally, physically, because some of you can't climb a tree. Um, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand in a moment. And that's you're climbing a tree. And you know what? When you do that, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, Hagar, Matt, he knows you by name. And you just say, here I am. And he says, I, I, I see you. I've been, I've been seeing you. It's not that I just see you now. I have been seeing you. I'm the God who sees. And then finally, to receive Christ. If you have never invited him in, he's saying to you the same thing he said to Zacchaeus. Today, I'm going to have a meal with you. I'm going to have fellowship with you. I'm going to have a relationship with you. You could know me personally. You don't have to go clean up your life first. You don't have to answer every question that you have first. But you could just take this step of faith to say, hey, would you come into my life? And I want to receive you. I ask that you would receive me. So we are going to pray. And then I'm just going to ask you wherever you are, you're going to uh, just to respond to the Lord by raising your hand for one of these things, one of these ways to respond. And I'm going to pray for each one by response. So let's, let's pray. Father, I'm so blessed, so blessed by your pursuit of us, that you look for us, you search for us. God, I think of Hagar and how you appeared to her in the desert. And Lord, I've heard of testimony after testimony of people in Iran and Iraq and places, God, where there's persecution, where people are having dreams and seeing this person that they don't know who this person is, but have to find out. God, I think of um, people, Lord, that I love, that I want them to open up that door to you. And so, Lord, I want to commit today to sharing the gospel, the good news with people. Lord, I, there's people that I'm afraid to share with, people that I've tried, people that I've failed with, people that I haven't made that attempt yet because I don't know how they would respond to me. And if that is you this morning and you're here online or here in person, you're saying, God, I commit to sharing who you are, the good news with people, to look for those opportunities. And if you bring it, God, that you would fill me with the love that overcomes my fear. And if that's you, raise your hand wherever you are. You're saying, God, I commit to sharing the gospel and I'm asking for your help. I'm asking for wisdom. I'm asking for the right words, but more than anything, I'm asking for your spirit to give me boldness and love. So God, you see who we are. My hand is up with these people. Lord, help us to share this good news. Help us to share your gospel with people because you love them. Jesus, you have come to seek and to save that which was lost. And God, today, we just say, here I am, Lord. We're part of your search and rescue team. Use us, God. Then for those of you maybe that have gone far from God, maybe like Zacchaeus or like Hagar, you feel like you're far from God and you feel like man, even your own behavior bothers you. Other people are bothered by it, but you're bothered by it. Or maybe you've just drifted and it's been a while and you could look back at to a time in your life when you thought, man, I was close to God because I was pursuing a relationship with God, but I haven't been pursuing. I've just been doing whatever I wanna do. And today that you would commit to, to draw near to Christ. In James, it says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And so is there anyone here? How many of you would say, Jesus, I, I wanna draw nearer to you. I've been going my own way. Just raise your hand wherever you are. If you're online, you could just let us know because we want to encourage you. Just raise your hand and say, Jesus, here I am. I've gone far from you, or maybe I've been distracted with life. Maybe even good things. I've been busy with work or school, finals. God, I've been uh, pursuing other things. And I just haven't taken time to get to know you better. And so, Lord, here I am. I pray that you would draw near to me as, 
as I desire to draw near to you. And by faith, I just raise my hand to say, God, do you see me? God, you see me right here, God, right here, right here. Father, I also want to pray for those who have never received Christ. And maybe it was a scary thing for them to come, to climb a tree, to get to this place, to listen. They still have questions, but from what they have heard, your spirit has been speaking to their hearts to say, I see you and I know you. I know you. I've known you since the day you were born. I know your situation. Maybe you feel like you've been running and I have been pursuing, not because I don't love you, but because I'm looking for you. In your lostness of pursuing other things that don't satisfy, don't bring hope, don't bring a love for others, don't bring a love for God, I'm here to let you know God is saying that I'm knocking at the door of your heart. So if there's anyone either either online or here in person, you just wanna say, Jesus, I wanna receive you. Just come on in. Would you raise your hand wherever you are? Jesus, I just want to have fellowship with you. I wanna know you personally. And you could do that. You just raise your hand where you are. Awesome. And if you are at home, you could do the same thing. Praise God. Just here I am. Here I am, Lord. You know me. And Father, For those that have raised their hand, Lord, you know them. Lord, you desire to come in and have fellowship. You desire to have relationship. You can know them personally and they can know you personally. So if that's you, would you, as you've prayed that, just between you and the Lord, just pray, Jesus, forgive me. There are things that I wish I could do over. I have regrets and um, sins and I just ask for your not only forgiveness, but, but your acceptance. So I, I, I open up the door to my life and I thank you for coming into this world, for dying for my sins. Thank you that when you rose, you showed that you really are legitimately who you said that you are. And so I receive you and ask that you would receive me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. If you're here and you pray to receive Christ over in the back, there's a prayer area. Love to pray with you, answer some questions for you. If you're online, just let us know, hey, um, whatever it is that you've prayed for, you could do that. We wanna, we wanna walk this journey with you. As followers of Jesus, none of us walk alone. And if you have questions, stay afterwards. We'll have a, a question and answer time as well, but let's, uh, let's sing and let's worship him together.